All right, and welcome to the uh, Existential Stoic Podcast. This is episode seven. I'm Danny, and I'm here with Randy. Hey, Danny. Hey, Randy. And today we're going to talk about life is beautiful. Why does my life suck? That's the title that we're working <laughs> with today. <laughs> Figured we'd get a lot of keywords in this one. Yeah, and it's uh, the idea today. Can, it's kind of self-reflective. Um, we both had an experience yesterday. Uh, we, I, well. I lost, we lost our dog, and Randy happened to be there, and uh, thankfully, because he's a vet, yeah. and it was nice to have him on hand, because he helped make sure that, you know, we did everything possible. I was an old bulldog, and, you know, he had, uh, he had some issues, and thankfully, he went, he went calmly and peacefully, and, you know, it was quick. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's experiences like those, like, I think, I know definitely for me, and probably for you as well, it just, experiences like that really brings out the preciousness of nut, of life, the fine edge between life and death. Oh yeah, it really does. And it's interesting because, you know, I was thinking about that right afterwards, right? We we don't even think about it most of the time, you know? And, and it happens so fast. And then afterwards you start to reflect on like, you know, everything that life meant to you and, you know, the expectations that you had of that that individual being with you all the time, whether it's a pet or a friend or whatever, right? And you know, it is, it's just, life is very kind of, you know, it's momentary almost in a way, right? Yeah, and that's, that's a very stoic philosophy considering your own mortality on a daily basis. Stop, Marcus Aurelius says, stop living like you have a thousand years to live and live every day like today could be your last because it, it could. It Who could, knows? yeah, it absolutely could, right? I mean, I, not to be morbid, but it could. And it's important to think that way also because it kind of, I think it it kind of points to like the importance of life, right? That we often take it for granted. And we were just saying, right, the expectation of things being the same. Mm. We kind of like human beings, we expect, you know, we expect sort of our routine, that security and comfort we get in things being a certain way. And we kind of get it in our heads that like they won't change even though we know kind of in the background they do change and you know even though you know we understand that you know change is a part of life we still kind of like have this weird expectation that things will just persist as they are forever yeah and that that kind of almost brings us to the second point why does my life suck because mm -hmm. oftentimes we get stuck in these ruts where our life sucks and even though in in all honesty we do know how to improve our life we're like this is my shit i'm gonna sit in it yeah, yeah, it's weird, right? When we, it's that it's, sense of constancy. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you know, I've heard I've heard that said before too. Um, you know that the comfort and familiarity we will take, like our depression, our pessimism, and we will like sort of sit in it for a long time, just because the to make a change would be to embrace the unknown. Yeah. And it's like I know what now feels like, even when it sucks. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have that comfort in the in the shittiness right yeah. rather than you know making those changes and taking a chance and it's even the sense of possession that we put on these things like instead of a passing depression it's my depression yeah yeah no. that's true right instead of a momentary you know emotional response or feeling or state of mind right we make it our own we identify with it and that's you know that's interesting too right the self-identification and how we define ourselves and then think of ourselves that way you know, through through that sort of active application of a concept or an idea, you know, we start to think of ourselves as, you know, I'm depressed, not, you know, I'm going through this, this time in my life or I'm grieving or whatever. I think of myself as depressed and then, you know, all of a sudden everything becomes sort of defined that way or seen through those kinds of like glasses, right? Yeah. So I think the, the title of this show, uh, Life is Beautiful, Why Does My Life Suck, is it kind of encapsulates the paradox of life because at any moment life is both beautiful and it sucks simultaneously all depending how you look at it yeah i mean that's absolutely true right and it's it's interesting too just to say how we look at it right i mean we can change literally by changing our mindset we can change how we see the world and what we see in the world and it's actually really amazing but that paradox kind of always exists between you know recognizing like you know the beauty even valuing it even deep down admitting it and then sort of on the other hand how we experience things and how we interpret them and you know choose to look at it i guess you could say yeah yeah there's that movie life is beautiful and it takes place during the holocaust yeah you know and it's just a guy choosing to look at things differently 
And you hear about all these people like Viktor Frankl and a bunch of Holocaust survivors. An amazing figure, yeah. I yeah. mean, Who just chose to look at things differently. And also, talk, I mean, I think he also talks about too, right? The idea of, you know, um, when you can't, ch he, says, he says when you can no longer change a situation, you have to change yourself, right? And I think that's an important quote and idea, right? The idea that, you know, if you can't change the externals, the only way sometimes to get through it, to deal with it, or to, you know, come out on the other side is to change yourself, change your thinking. Yeah. 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 That's the that's the only way to really change anything. You know, I was at work the other day and and uh, somebody was saying like I've never seen you get really angry at everyone else. Like I've seen the other doctors <laughs> get angry and I've never seen you get angry. And in my head I was thinking I was like I'm angry all the fucking time. Like, what, are, what are you I'm talking about? I'm constantly angry. But, what do you mean? <laughs> but but my response was I was like it's not good. You can't change anyone else. Like, I know that the only person I can change is me. So if I get angry with someone else, that just shows I have a habit of being critical. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And so even though, even though I do get angry with them and I, I don't express it externally because the anger just shows that I have something to work on within myself. Yeah, and that's, it's interesting too, right? The only thing we truly have control over is ourselves. And, you know, this is a good time to talk about this anyway because, you know, the election... You know, what just election? happened, right? Yeah, what election? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, every that was on everybody's mind, whatever side you you were on, right? That was on everyone's mind. You have the uncertainty of the times, the coronavirus. They keep saying, you know, we got this second wave or whatever. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things in the world right now. There's a lot of you know turmoil and strife that make it seem, you know, complicated, difficult, stressful, depressing, you know, lonely, whatever, right? All those things that we can see in the world. At the same time, there's also these little things that we can experience in our own lives that we can kind of, it's almost like these, this harsh contrast, right? Like, yeah. like I took a walk the other day and it was a beautiful sunny day. This was on, a, would have been Friday. I was out in the woods, the leaves are changing and I was just by myself and it was amazing. Like I really did have a great time. Everything seemed, you know, wonderful at that moment, right? But I was away from the distractions and all the other kind of, you know, negativity, I guess. Yeah. I think it comes down to choosing what to focus on. There's like the Pollyanna principle or finding the silver lining where every situation has a silver lining. Like yesterday when the dog passed, I mean like moments before he passed, it was a beautiful afternoon. Like yeah. blue skies, birds were chirping, you know, everything was beautiful. He was loving his life out he on was the porch. He was playing. Yeah, he had just met Randy. He's playing. You know, he's he's jumping on his lap. And actually, the funny thing is, I texted my my fiance a picture of him playing with Randy. Like ten minutes before all this happened, really bad timing. It's just one of those things. <laughs> but he was enjoying himself. He was yeah. he was happy, alert. Yeah. You know, and then then it happened. Yeah, he went. I mean, he went doing what he loved. It, it wasn't a terrible ending in a hospital. It was at his favorite place on earth, and, and it wasn't drawn out. Yeah. It was the best you can hope for, but the fu it doesn't make it any easier. You know, I mean, that's, no. the, that's the truth. It really doesn't. Um, and for me, there was like a palpable change. I mean, there was a, definitely a palpable change in the emotional content of life when that happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? That you can kind of like feel it. Yeah. And you, it's almost, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, right? But, you know, because obviously the mood of everyone immediately changed. You know, it went from mm -hmm. a, a carefree kind of like, beautiful day enjoying our time to suddenly like a major event and that really does shift things dramatically mm -hmm. yeah and is you know another thing about this life is beautiful thing is what what really happens where does life go where does it go that's a good question but yeah. like what would what would existential or, or stoic philosophers say now that's an interesting question you know i think the existentialist um many of them were See, one of the interesting thing about the existentialists is many of them deny the existence of God, right? Now, Kierkegaard, one of the fathers of existentialism, famously was a Christian, and so his, but he he was sort of against the establishment, the Christian, you know, institution. Um, but he did very much believe in God, and so maybe for him, in his case, you know, he thought maybe there was something else after. He probably believed something uh, sort of similar to what you know Christianity suggests. The other existentialists, they deny the existence of God, but it's not always clear that they just think there's nothing, right? It's more that it's unknown. And I think there is an important distinction between saying you don't believe in something 
and, and recognizing that we don't know what happens, right? There is a huge distinction there. But I've always wondered that myself, right? Because you see the light go out, the physical body remains, and you know, you're know you stuck with this question of like, how is there a, that attachment of life yeah. to the body before and then not after? Yeah, and it's like with, with the dog, we almost saw it in his eyes, mm -hmm. right? It was amazing, like, it was really actually, it was really amazing and interesting, like, it was like something in his eyes changed right before he fell over, and it's like at that moment, it's like you knew what happened, and it was like the life, the life went out of his eyes, and was, you mm -hmm. know, it was interesting. Um, and then you're you're left with this question too, like is is our conscious life or being alive is it all really just physical? Is it all tied to physical reality, or is there something else beyond it? What do yeah. you think on that issue? <laughs> it's it's something it bends my mind sometimes because I see this a lot at work. I mean, part of my job is euthanasia, and so I, like, I see pets leave their bodies on a regular basis, and, it, it, you know, it, it bends my mind, and it freaks me out sometimes when I think about what is that, what is that going to be like for me? Oh, yeah, yeah, and what, it, what will it be like for me? And, you know, it's interesting, when I, when I taught biomedical ethics, you know, and you, you talk about euthanasia for people, and it's a big issue and a big question, right? There's a lot of benefits, a lot of negatives, a lot of people on both sides. But one of the um, one of the ways to look at it is you look at you know how do you define death, and some philosophers define death as basically your the loss of your conscious self, not you know necessarily your physical body, the termination of biological life, because you know in cases where like you know you have a a, a long, drawn out ordeal with a, a you know a terminal illness, you know your quality of life might diminish greatly. You might lose your your conscious self. You might be a totally different person. And that's a way to sort of argue, right, that it's acceptable in those cases, or that's where the mm -hmm. person, and it's, you know, it raises a host of really interesting questions that I have, it's, it's really, yeah, it does blow your mind, right? Yeah. And there's so many unknowns in this world, which is part of what I think makes life beautiful, right? There's so many things that we just don't know, um, you know, that are really, you know, honestly amazing. Like the fact that, you know, the world is this way, there's infinite possibilities and we have the world that we have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because it could have been anything. We could have been Martians with, <laughs> with two butts, one on our upper back. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> could have been on a planet with four moons, right, instead yeah. of one or two suns or whatever. Because binary suns are apparently having the pairs is actually more common, if I remember correctly, wow. than having a singular sun. So, yeah. I mean, there's any number of things that could have happened, but the fact is, is this is what we have. Yeah. And, you know, it's that interesting kind of contrast between all these possibilities and the fact that, you know, what is, is. Yeah. So kind of as an exercise to anybody out there listening, you can just take a look at where you are now and observe what's beautiful in your life right now. Or what could be beautiful. Yeah. You know? Is it the is it the changing colors of the trees? Is it the blue sky that doesn't happen that often? Yeah. Is it the the time you spent with a friend recently or the time with a loved one? You know, what is it? Is it taking that hour to yourself to watch your favorite show on Netflix. Yeah, or just laughing, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. enjoying, you know, enjoying a moment, um, you know, enjoying a laugh. Is it, you know, I mean, it's interesting too, because when you say life is beautiful, you know, I think a lot of times, I don't know, personally, right, I, I tend to think aesthetically, right? So in the sense of like, you know, you know, something appears beautiful and so forth and so on, but it can also be beautiful in a lot of different ways. You know, happiness, you know, relationships, all of that you know I was just thinking about that saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder yeah <laughs> and so it makes you think that life is beautiful in the eye of the beholder oh yeah so it is 100% up to you for life to be beautiful so if your life isn't beautiful it means you're dropping the ball <laughs> it's, li yeah. it's li I mean don't beat yourself up for it but it's yeah. your fault yeah I mean well no it's interesting right because I don't it's amazing how we can totally transform the way we see things and the way we interpret them. I mean, totally transform them. And I know I've been through this myself. I have personal experience. Like, you know, times when I've had an existential crisis or I've been depressed, I mean, the world looks different. And it's amazing because when you start to come out of that on the other side, nothing necessarily has changed, right, in my life. It's not like, you know, my day is wildly different. Or, you know, something crazy dramatic has changed. I have the same amount of money. I'm in the same, you know, same relationships and all. Same physical place. But all of a sudden, it seems so different. 
and it's really amazing. Like, even little things, like, you know, going for a walk or, like, taking a shower seem great, and it's weird, you know, that before I thought of it as, like, this burden, struggle, difficult, right? And then you get this dramatic change, but it's all really just me at the end of the day. Yeah. It's how I'm interpreting it. Yeah. So, taking a look at why does my life suck... I think let's take a look at it from both an existentialist and a stoic point of view. Yeah, let's do it. I can say from, from a stoic point of view that why does my life suck? Because it's a necessary obstacle you need to endure through. Like Endurance this is, is important, This yeah. is building your character. This, this sucking of your life is something that's necessary to build your character so that you can bear the weight of the blessing that's coming your way. That's a good way to look at it, yeah. So those burdens, those struggles that strife that you face in your life, those are all obstacles that present challenges to you from which you can grow. And also give you a different, I mean really they also enable you to have a better perspective afterwards, right? Because you've been through it. Yeah. And I think that is a, that's an important way to look at it. You know, I think the, it's interesting, the existentialists probably would agree in a lot of ways, you know, that it's one, I mean I think they're very much, you know, it's our interpretation or point of view is gonna dictate how we see things, right? But they also are, it's very interesting because that idea of like, you know, how we interpret suffering, how we interpret struggle, strife, I think there's a lot of overlap here because they also think that these are things that really define us. They show us what we're capable of. They, you know, they make it possible for us to realize sort of our abilities, like what we can endure, what we can get over and get through. And they're, you know, they're character defining. They really are. You know, those are often the moments that when you look back on your life and reflect back, you, you will end up looking at those moments, the most difficult ones, as positive because they define, they make you who you are, right? Yeah. And I also believe that the suffering actually allows us to have a better connection with others because we realize how much suffering is going on in the world. Like the Buddha said, life is suffering and everyone suffers and, and oftentimes going through a deep suffering connects me with other people that much more because I have that much more compassion for them when they're suffering. Yeah, it gives us more compassion. It makes us more aware of others. And it's important to remind ourselves too that, you know, it's never just, it's never just me as an individual going through it, right? Everyone goes through it. Everyone will experience this kind of stuff in their lives, these kinds of obstacles. And, you know, a lot of times how you, how you endure through it, whether you get through it is ultimately, you know, up to you. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, will tell us a lot about, you know, how you are and the type of person you are. Yeah. So what can people do when their life sucks? <laughs> that is a good question, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know, I think, I mean, I think one of the most difficult things is, is getting, even in the, in the most difficult times, you know, seeing, seeing this or starting to look at it as an opportunity. I think everything in life is an opportunity, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but seeing it as an opportunity to, to, to figure out a way through, to, to figure something out about yourself. And you know, it might take time, it might be difficult, but figuring out a small step you can make towards, right, something better, or towards like self-development or you know, whatever that's going to help you get through it. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would challenge people to kind of look back on di other difficult times they've had and what helped them go through it, get through it. Yeah, that's a good idea too, right? So how they've, when they've overcome something in the past, and just the fact that you've gotten through something in the past mm -hmm. is always, you know, helps us remember that, you know, we can get through this. And if this is your first challenge in life, I mean, welcome to the club. Yeah, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny, I tell myself sometimes too when I'm going through, like, I'll tell myself a lot of times that it's just life. Like, it is just life. I shouldn't, you know, because it's so easy to put too much sort of, I guess to, I don't know how to say this, like put too much into the situation. Too much emphasis on yeah, it. Yeah, put too much emphasis on it. Focus, you know, your, your focus becomes very narrowed. Mm -hmm. It's all you see. Yeah, yeah. Like even like, for instance, all right, this election. Mm -hmm. It was like people had tunnel vision, man. That's all they saw. All they talked about was like, you know, who's going to win the presidency? Well, the fact is, there's a lot of other things that matter. And also, the president alone doesn't dictate everything. You know, there's a lot of other stuff that, you know, matters for our country, for our government, for how things are run. You know, just electing this person won't fix everything, um, regardless of what side, right, you were on. But it's funny because we get this tunnel vision, like where that thing becomes the only thing that matters. And when this happens in our own lives as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's just more apparent, I think, when everyone sort of 
falls into it for a time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when this thing becomes all obsessive, we just want it fixed. You know, like we want we want a solution for that and we want it now. Whereas instead taking a meditation technique and just noting it. Yeah. You know, like noting that, oh, here's this thing again. All right. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah, that's basically it. If you just note it and you let go, let it be what it is, eventually it'll pass. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it, right? Just identify it, recognize it, but don't attach to it. Don't focus on it. Don't yep. make it more than it is. Yeah. And just, and just almost being gentle with yourself because you are just learning. We're all just funny little bunnies trying yeah. to <laughs> get our way through here and just be like, oh, there I go again. Ah, yeah. here it happened again. All right. That's the third time in five minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, it's funny. We talked about that before, right? But a lot of great, great thinkers over the ages, you know, sages, philosophers, what have you, they, they remind us to, to sort of recognize our folly and not take it so seriously all the time. We all will make mistakes, right? We all will suffer. That's part of being alive. That's part of being human. That's part of trying to find ourselves, to understand ourselves. You know, it's interesting. And we were talking about this before too, but you mentioned expectations, right? You, you see this problem, you focus on it, you want it dealt with immediately, right now. You don't want to deal with it again in the future. But that's all because our expectations have kind of become warped, I think, especially in the last like 20 years. You know, technology has made it possible to communicate so fast, to get things done very quickly that used to take a long time. I mean, even like communication with like, you know, we used to have to use letters that would take months. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back in the day, it took months and you would wait and wait and wait for a communication from someone. Now it's like, instant right you expect a response the second you hit send it's yeah. like insane uh, and you get what you know you get aggravated or worried when somebody doesn't respond immediately or look at like you know we were talking about delivery with packages right you know when we were younger like if a store didn't have something you ordered it, it was weeks usually before you got it like yep. it wasn't immediate but yeah. our expectations have changed dramatically yeah and it, and it really skews our perception of when changes should occur in life yeah, and I think it makes it a lot harder to be patient, right? It, it's yeah. very much kind of like destroyed our patience in a way. Yeah, yeah. Because if you take a look at everything that you have now, there's a good chance that sometime in the past, you really wanted this thing and you didn't have it. Yeah, yeah. But you got it. So now there's a good chance that everything that you want now, you're going to get it in the future, but it's just not going to be on your timeline. No, yeah, it's not going to be instant, right? Yeah. That's a good point, though, too, right? I think that's so important, right? The idea that when we really do focus on change and we focus on bettering ourselves and we focus on sort of really just living our lives and trying to live better, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Because doing something is really the biggest step, right? As long as you put your mind to something, focus, and you're persistent, you will get through it, you will endure, and you will come out on the other side with whatever you wanted. Yeah, yeah. I always, I always laugh about this one situation in my life that happened. Like every time, every time I'm kind of lackluster with life and not feeling exactly happy, I kind of look at it. And I remember this time when I was an undergrad, and I was like, I was talking with my roommate, and I was like, you know, man, as soon as I'm a vet, everything's gonna be great. Like all I need to do <laughs> is just be a vet, and then everything will be fine. And now I'm a vet, and everything, <laughs> and I've brought me along with me. Mm -hmm. You know. It's like the book, wherever you go, there you are. And, that is it. And that's basically it. Because if you think that being, doing, or having something different is going to make you happy, as soon as you be, do, or have that, you're going to have the same mindset that got you there. You're yeah. going to think something else is going to make you happy. You do. And it's funny that we do think that way. And that's a great example, right? We think, oh, as soon as I get this or that, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be perfect. Yep. And then you don't... It's funny because when we tell ourselves that, it's almost like a... It's almost like a, a way to deny the fact that we also need to change ourselves. Yeah. That we also need to grow. Yeah. If we really want to be happy, if we really want to see the world differently. All right. And so the step that we can take now, which goes with the life is beautiful aspect of it, is we can observe the things in our life now that we wanted before, that we told ourselves once we have that, we'll be happy. And we can observe those things and actually practice being happy. Yeah. You can practice being happy, being grateful, yeah. right? Being thankful for what you have in the world now for, and you're kind of also recognizing the differences from how you were before, which is a good way to sort of think about, you know, your progress too, and yeah. that it is possible. Yeah. I mean, that's another great exercise you just mentioned there. 
just comparing yourself with where you were previously in terms of development. Oh, like, yeah. Take a look at yourself 10 years ago and just <laughs> compare yourself. Like, what a better person you are. And yeah. It's just like, it's okay. mind blowing. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're a better person. You are, you're more mature, right? You have a lot more skills and you have a lot more abilities that you didn't have. And, you know, when you compare yourself to the outside, though, you miss all of that. I think that's also one of the critical sort of errors we make in judgment. Yeah. And the difficulty in that comes that there's so many more outside sources to compare yourself to. Oh, yeah. It's like a hundred years ago, you lived in a small town with maybe like a hundred people or a thousand people and it tops. Yeah. Most of the time you just lived on a farm. Yeah. And so you basically yeah. just had your family to compare yourself to. Yeah, we had mentioned this before, right? Big Roman cities back in the day were like 4,000, maybe 10,000. I mean, that's not a lot of people. Yeah. You didn't have Instagram every day updating you with the prettiest people and the most successful <laughs> people. Like, you didn't have these people to compare yourself to. But now it's like, no matter how successful you are in your life, there's always other areas and other people who are more successful than you in other areas. And if you compare yourself to them, it's just instant dissatisfaction. It's instant dissatisfaction, yeah. And it's also like, you know, it kind of, I think, makes us sort of, I don't know, like obscures what we really want, too. Because we start to look at these other people and what they have, and we start to like kind of focus on what they have and compare ourselves to that, and then we forget too, like almost along the way, what we were after, what we wanted, what's right for us. You know, I think that's the also critical thing here is you know, it's living your own life, right? It's taking control of your own life of what you have control over, and sort of resisting or letting go of what you don't have control over. Yeah, it's a difficult question, right? <sighs> So what is life and... <laughs> so what is life? <laughs> yeah, what is life, right? We haven't answered that yet. Uh, I remember when I was young, I was probably like seven years old or something like that. And uh, my grandfather, who was the smartest person I knew at the time, he was a, a chemist who worked on the Manhattan Project. And so he was a really smart guy. But I was like... I would think he was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, can you prove you're not just a figment of my imagination? <laughs> And I mean, he was like, nope, sorry, can't help you there. Nope, yeah. I have no idea, because you yeah. could be a figment of mine. Yeah, I mean, what, what if all of life is just this thing that we make up? In a way, it is, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, because our, our minds, our interpretation really dictates how we see reality, you know? It's how we see, whether we see somebody as a, as a threat, or whether we see them as a, a potential friend, whether we think yeah. of ourselves as belonging or not, or, you know, all these things. Yeah. It's such a complex thing to think of how yeah. li how life is what I think it is, but then it's also what you think it is, and somehow those things merge together, and then there's all these other people, and it's what they think it is. Oh yeah, it's crazy. And, I mean, there's like a little overlap, but it's also really individual, and it's really hard to wrap your mind around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I think too on the side of the life is beautiful thing, and why does my life suck? You know. This idea of going through suffering, struggles, trials, and learning to deal with them and seeing them differently. You know, we often think of like suffering and struggle as something we should avoid, something we should, you know, because look, it's really easy to live right now. We're all about comfort. I mean, if we're being honest, right? We're all about like the immediate pleasure. We don't, we don't necessarily do a lot of things that cause us a lot of pain or difficulty. Yeah, tell them about the, uh, the marathoners. Oh, the yeah, yeah, me, yeah. That's a really interesting thing about comfort and pain. It is interesting. Yeah, I, I had heard a story. It was on NPR. They were talking about, you know, the runners that... A lot of these runners that are breaking all these records, they come from a specific village or area. And basically, you know, they're, they run everywhere from an early age. And they're really... They just... Enduring through the pain is part of their life. And part of sort of their their progression into adulthood or being considered uh you know a full member i guess of the community or whatever they go through this sort of they used to make them go through these trials that were very painful um including circumcision and then basically unaided without any sort of anesthetic or anything like that or anything to help with pain and then they would have to run afterwards and run everywhere in order to get anywhere right and so they were much more equipped to deal with that pain mentally and to endure through it and so other runners were getting creamed by these guys because, you know, their ability to endure that pain was just not nearly as high, right? I mean, they just couldn't do it. Even though it's probably the pain itself is probably, I imagine, similar, right? It's your interpretation of it that's different or your ability to, to persist through it. 
I find it really interesting now that stoicism is super popular in a very comfort oriented culture. It's because like stoicism is the yeah. exact opposite of comfort. It's like basically enduring pain. And then it's very popular right now in this consumer oriented comfort culture. Well, you- and, and, and it's the other part about it that's really interesting is as humans, we've tried so long to make life so comfortable that now it's extremely comfortable, and because of it, we're causing ourselves so much psychological pain. No, yeah, it's interesting, right? I think that might be, that might actually be one of the reasons why it's so popular too, right? Is that, you know, life is beautiful, why has my life sucked? I mean, that's kind of it, right? It hits on it, because we're all sort of so used to this comfort all the time, and at the same, I mean, you know, we pick out furniture, cars, all based on how comfortable it is for us, right? And we're looking for something that, you know, basically we feel no pain, no struggle. Mm. And then when we do have to deal with any of it in life, we're finding ourselves struggle. We're finding ourselves question ourselves. You know, we're, we're mental blocks left and right. And then we're looking for something, for a way to kind of start recognizing and dealing with it and learning to deal with it, right? We don't talk about character that much in, the, in, in this day and age, right? We don't talk about, we really don't talk about enduring through things that much, I don't think. And mm. there. Yeah, and sort what, of. what I was just thinking of when you were talking about that was how you were talking about uh, the book uh, where it talks about finding the golden mean of the virtues. Oh, Aristotle. Right. Okay, so not excess, not deficiency, but trying to find the golden mean. And if you look at it, you know, comfort can be one extreme and pain can be another extreme and trying to find the golden mean of that. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it, right? That if the goal of virtue is building a character that that really you know that golden mean is the ideal you're always in the middle between those two points yeah i think that's that's true right that pain would be one extreme comfort pleasure would be the other but we need to be in the middle we need to be able to endure through the one take pleasure in the other but not get kind of lost in either right yeah and i think that's the biggest difficulty is all this stuff becomes a block it becomes a limitation on us and i think that's the thing we struggle with the most you know all these moments all these trials they can also be kind of something that limits us completely as can our comfort our expectations they can limit us greatly as well you know that that fear of taking a step forward because of the unknown i mean it's a huge limit right i mean i've faced that myself i know you have and at the same time it's like we also know that if we just take the step forward it will happen eventually Everything right we'll get opens there up. it's like i mean it's like driving at nighttime you can't see beyond your headlights yeah. But once you once you move a little bit forward, guess what? Your headlights are that far forward too. That's a good way, yeah, it's a good way to look at it. I like that. Because you know, you're always kind of you're always gonna make the, the path in front of you clear the more the more steps forward you take, right? It will always become clear just a little bit further ahead. Yeah. And sometimes there'll be twists and turns, but you'll see them. You know, you'll be able to anticipate them and make the changes you need to make. Yeah. And if you don't know what to do, just start working on it and eventually the answer will come to you. I think that, yeah, that's great advice too, right? The idea that just doing things will always make us more likely to recognize, right, ways to get through any sorts of troubles or difficulties, solve problems. And, you know, the more we kind of just work on ourselves and work on our creativity, you know, the more we're able to use it and the more we're able to offer. Yeah. Yeah. uh, There's this, Naval Ravikant talks about, I think it's like five different types of luck. And I can't, I can't talk about all of them because I don't remember. But I would <laughs> recommend looking that up. Just search in Valve Ravikant luck. But he talks about how, you know, one of them is just building experience through doing. That's going to be luck. Hmm. Because you're going to get better at it and you're going to be luckier. Another form of luck is by just throwing enough shit against the wall. Eventually something's going to stick. Yeah. That's going to be luck. <laughs> and, there, and there's multiple other types of luck. But it's just... The more you do, the better a chance there will be that something will work. Whereas I, if you don't do anything, you're guaranteed 100% certainty that it won't happen. Yeah, and I like that idea too, right? Because it's the luck is the luck is actually possible because of your action. It's not that you're just lucky, right? It's not just like this weird thing that just happens and all of a sudden you have what you want, right? You yeah. have to do something. But everybody loves that fairy tale. Yeah, that they all do. of a sudden, you know, Cinderella finds the golden slipper. <laughs> And uh, Justin Bieber just magically becomes this hit musician, and Mark Zuckerberg just magically becomes this billionaire. That didn't happen magically. No. It was a long time of uh, concentration, concentrated effort, 
before they were recognized. And you might say, and of course, right? You can say that absolutely, I think every successful person, absolutely, there's, there's definitely luck involved. Whether it's, you know, the right time, right place. Whether it's, you know, just like, you know, that society's ready for it or whatever. Yeah. But they took a chance and they did yeah. something. So you can't say that it was just like, you know, something fell from the sky, literally, right? Yeah. I think it was Lincoln who said, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah, it makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> it makes absolute sense. And it's like the thing we forget the most. And it's so frustrating, too, once you realize it yourself, right? That I'm not, it's me, right? I'm mm -hmm. perpetuating my situation. I'm making it worse. I mean, when I, I realized about that, about myself when I was depressed, you know, I realized like there was, I don't know, it wasn't like a specific day, but there's this realization that like, oh my God, I am holding my back, myself back from everything, from living my life. And it's like, what do I, and one day I asked myself, I was like, what do I really want? Do I want to just be negative and depressed or do I want to try to live? Because frankly, like I wanted to try to live. I wanted to live my life. And you know, it might be difficult at times, it might be great at times, but I knew if I just did nothing, if I stayed in that mindset, it would have just gotten worse. Yeah. Nothing would have gotten better, nothing would have improved. Yeah. I mean, I've heard, I've heard stories of that about both Buckminster Fuller, the guy who invented the geodesic dome, and then also William James, the father of modern psychology. Both of them had reached this point in their life where they were like extremely depressed, they were on the verge of suicide, and they both just made up their mind. They're like, I'm gonna take this period of time, a year or whatever it is, and I'm gonna do everything in my power to improve my life. And if at the end of that year, my life hasn't improved, then I'll take my life. You know, that's a great way to look at it, right? Because yeah. you're guaranteed improvement. Yeah. If you do anything, right? You're guaranteed improvement. <laughs> right. It's like you you save yourself in that respect. Yeah. But you're also giving yourself a reason to do something and you're realizing that you have to do something. Yeah. And it, it's the worst feeling. I mean, I, I hate feeling like, you know, when you feel, down or everything seems negative it's terrible it really yeah. is and, and the worst part is that the mind makes you think that it won't ever be any other way yeah our mind really our, our mind's fantastic at that right the mm -hmm. imagination runs wild you I know. just wonder why it conspires against you at those times it would seem like the <laughs> least opportune time for your mind to not be working in your favor it is funny you know Dostoevsky said that you know famously said consciousness is a disease or an illness right <laughs> being overly conscious yeah. because the more we think about things it is like the more we work against ourselves and it doesn't make any sense yeah. but when we it's like it's almost like a when you free yourself of that you can move forward yeah. and you know it's all still there that's what I love it's this change of interpretation but why do we do that to ourselves I don't know there's no good answer but yeah, we all it, do it and, and like when life is going good your mind is so happy and positive and sunshiny and then when it's going bad your life is so pessimistic it kind of reminds me of trading because i i trade a little bit with uh, cryptocurrencies and with trading you want to be against what everyone else is doing so when something is when the price is just dropping and it feels gut-wrenching and you're like how could you possibly buy it now that's when you want to buy that makes whereas, sense yeah <laughs> whereas when when you feel like oh i need i should hold on to this forever that's when you want to sell and I mean, maybe that's, those are the indications we should take in life, that when life feels absolutely terrible, like it's going to be that way forever, actually being happy about that. That's a good way and to then, look at it, right? Yeah. yeah. And then when, you know, when everything's all sunshine and rainbows, actually then being critical. And I think, you know what, I think that's a, that's a very nice way too of saying, you know, like, and I think both these philosophies support that idea, right? That we need to start looking at the difficulties in life, the struggles, the trials, as opportunities, as chances to grow, to better ourselves, to become better individuals, right? To become stronger, have stronger characters, we can endure more, but it's also about recognizing it, that we'll be able to make that step, right? And be able to catch it and sort of not allow ourselves to get lost in our own thoughts. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, so myself personally, generally when things are bad in my life, that's when I go about trying to change a whole bunch of stuff. And that's when I'm like super critical of myself and super hard <laughs> on myself. Do you feel the same way about you? I mean, yeah, when things are, when things are really bad, I tend to get overly critical of everything I do. Um, in a way, it's almost like I'm, I'm blaming myself for it, but also like, it's weird. It's almost like blaming myself for it and also like ensuring that I stay in that situation and I found to like uh, one thing I did learn, and I, maybe this will be, uh, maybe this is helpful. But one of the things I did when I was really struggling was I, I decided to just try and be positive about one thing a day, 
and get that one thing done in the most in as positive I, as I could possibly be. And to be honest, it wasn't that positive. I mean, a lot of times, but it did make it possible to get that one thing done. And once I started doing that, it really made it easier to start making movements forward. Yeah. You know, and I think that was really helpful. But it, it's hard because you know, when things are going bad, you get in that you get in that negative state. It's like I start to cr- criticize everything I'm doing, like really hard on mm-hmm. myself and. Learning to deal with that too, I think, is is part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I guess what I was gonna ask from that is like, have you ever at those times just tried to be really compassionate with yourself? Oh yeah, recognize that it's like okay. Is yeah. it okay to be like, like I'm this? trying to. I'm, I'm. This is something that I'm gonna write down for myself for a new practice for when I do get down to just try and be very compassionate with myself and very loving with myself. Because those aren't the times when it's beneficial to be. No, they ruin it, right? They ruin it. They make it so much harder. They add so many limitations and blocks. They cause you to like your sight becomes really narrow. You can't, Eh. you know, you can't see all the opportunities around you. You can't see all the things that are beautiful. You know, it really makes life dark. And I think that's a great point. Being, you know, being compassionate with yourself and saying it's okay, right? Yeah. You know, because it is okay. It's okay to be like this. It's okay to be anyway. We're people. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're all going to go through a lot of similar experiences, and it is okay. Uh, the yeah. problem is when we don't do anything, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, if it was a good friend going through it or someone you cared about, you definitely want to be compassionate with them and caring with them. But somehow when it's ourselves going through it, we're like, <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have to do this. There's something wrong with me. What's wrong with you? Ah. Yeah, we act like it's our fault, right? Yeah. We take it out on ourselves. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because it, it, it is weird that we do this to ourselves, though. It's like we're fighting ourselves almost. It's yeah. very strange. But I think that's great advice, right? Being more compassionate with yourself, more gentle, caring, and understanding, basically. Yeah. Who created this mind? What were they thinking? It was a terrible <laughs> design, right? It really was bad. You yeah. know... If it was nature, it was a terrible adaptive capacity because it could have been a lot easier. Yeah. I wonder if I wonder how much life may have been... I wonder what it would have been like to live, you know, a thousand or two thousand years ago. <laughs> like, when, when things changed so slowly that we had time to evolutionarily adapt to them. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we have no time now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, I think about that a lot, too. It's interesting because... You look at society and, you know, the the nurture versus, versus nature thing, we don't really know exactly, but it is true that, right, obviously, society, culture plays a huge part in shaping us and who we are. Our expectations, what we think about ourselves, what we think about the world, and it's like, it changes so fast now, and it's it also is a, like, I think one of the things we forget, too, is it's very conflicting now. When like, or, I mean, uh, you know, you get a lot of different perspectives now all at once whereas before you probably only had like you know you were in a small town a small city you probably didn't get all these outside views right that that kind of like conflicted if you ever got any yeah i mean yeah exactly right if you got any and you're right like the world the human world changed a lot slower you know a thousand years ago i mean it took a long time for things to actually i mean you know your big developments were like you know agriculture and stuff like these types of things that weren't really like gigantic leaps forward Whereas now it seems like every freaking new technology and new development is like a huge leap. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. That would have been probably nice. A little slower paced, right? Yeah. So anything else we have to say about this today? Because it is hot in this car. Yeah, it is recording. very hot. Yeah, it's a hot oh day today. Goodness. Hot in the middle of November. I know. I'm it's sweating weird. in November. <laughs> Global warming. Right? No, uh, I mean, I think that's, yeah, you know, I think that's... The biggest takeaway, I guess, would be its perspective, right? It's how we look at things and what we need to do. And I think existential, existentialists and Sto- Stoics, would say, or Stoics would say the same thing, right? Is It's about working on ourselves and about being compassionate with ourselves, understanding ourselves, and taking those steps forward to change. Because as long as we're making steps forward, we're bettering our lives, right? And we're going to live better lives. And ideally, working on positivity is helpful. Um, because it will help us sort of interpret those things differently. But just recognizing, you know, the power of thought, I think, is important. Because that really, really dictates everything else. Yeah. Yeah. We are what we think. So I guess today, just taking that that moment and uh, noticing how life is beautiful. Yeah. Right? It's a good Be, practice. Yeah. Being compassionate with yourself. Yeah. Take a moment, too, and just enjoy the moment. I think that's important. <laughs> we don't know how many we have. We should enjoy it. Oh, definitely. Oh, God, we should enjoy it. (laughs) Well, 
Good times today, Danny. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for your help, man. Good talking to you, Randy. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see you next week. All right, and if you uh, like us, subscribe, what have you, and we'll be back next week with another episode. All right, peace. Peace.